you know that the um, oldest surviving uh, aerial photograph still to be in existence is James Wallace Black's uh, photograph of Boston taken in 1860 from a hot air balloon. Now it's the oldest surviving aerial photograph. It's likely not the first one. Uh, that was much more likely taken by a very famous uh, French photographer. Uh, called Nadar, uh, a you know, very fascinating kind of eccentric um, character in uh, French photography and indeed just photography history. Uh, he also took aerial photographs of Paris from hot air balloons, but unfortunately none of his images are still available. So this has the claim to fame for being the oldest surviving photograph taken from the air. A really fascinating photograph from James Wallace Black's hot air balloon. So, well, gent, we're on lesson number seven. We're going to be having a look at how to get perfect exposures every single time. We're not going to be guessing anymore what's happening when our camera takes a photograph when we're using our automatic or semi-automatic modes. And we're going to have a look at how we can also control exposure in these modes as well. It is still possible to uh, control the exposure here when the camera doesn't get it right. And then we'll have a look at how we can take full control in the next lesson. So this is a big, big lesson uh, in terms of understanding how we can use our fully manual mode. And the first thing we have to be able to do is, of course, identify what type of exposure we have captured. So hopefully this isn't the type of scene you've ever come across uh, in your own cameras. Um, an overexposed photograph, and it would be particularly disastrous on a wedding day like this. But we can identify an overexposed photograph. It's simply just too much light. Um, and we can tell this because the highlights and the whites are completely overblown. And that means we have lost details in those white tones. If we have a look at the skin tones here, there's, there's just absolutely no details there at all. We've lost all the details here um, you know, in this kind of hairband. We've lost all the details here in the dress. That's That would be a complete disaster. And we've also lost details here. So we can identify an overexposed photograph when there is a lack of detail in the brightest parts of the photograph. The opposite of that then, of course, is an underexposed photograph. This is when the camera has not got enough light to get the correct exposure. We've got darker details here. And the information is being lost in the dark and in the black tones. So in this particular photograph, you know, we can see the sky is just dull it's it's very dark gray you know we're losing details here in the background everything just looks flat and um, and it just doesn't look right at all so everything is just simply too dark and this is an underexposed shot and the correct exposure is one where we've got details in the highlights where we've got details in the dark tones uh, and it looks correct to our eyes it looks as we would see it and this is really what we're trying to strive for when we're taking photographs through our camera is to try and get something that looks the same as when we were actually there so if we have a look at this photograph here you can see we've loads of details here in the darkest part and the shadow areas here uh, we've lots of details here in the highlights here as well in the distant mountains it's just loads and loads of information here that we can see and nothing is too bright or nothing is too dark now it's very very important uh, to say this early on don't rely on post-production. Don't rely on editing your photographs afterwards. This kind of mentality of, I can fix that afterwards in post-production, it's not a productive way of thinking. Now, post-production plays a huge part in our photography. And, you know, we have an entire module dedicated to our post-production in module number four, uh, pretty much the very end, um, you know, of our photography journey. And that's when it should really come into play. Uh, but... It, this kind of idea where you've got an exposure like oh, i can kind of fix it afterwards that isn't always the case you know you're going to have situations where you might lose all the, the details in the highlights you might lose all the details in the dark parts and if you don't know how to correct it in camera you know you may not always be able to get it back in post-production so it's not good to have that way of thinking we should always be striving to get as close to as possible to perfection within the camera and then use post-production as a way of bringing our photographs to another level creatively so 
with that in mind let's talk about stops of light and stops of light is how we measure light within our cameras you may have heard this term before and we're going to demystify exactly what stops of light are in this lesson and it's a term that i also want you to start using at the end of this lesson as well so the first thing is we now know where our shutter speeds and our apertures are located on our cameras we also now know exactly what our shutter speeds and our apertures do shutter speed controls motion in our photography aperture controls the depth of field but these also control the, for how long the light enters the camera and the amount of light that enters the camera okay now when we are photographing in our semi and our auto modes camera will select the aperture and shutter speed combination to get the, the correct exposure for the scene and this combination is known as the exposure values for the scene now we'll speak about exposure values much more in detail at the end of the lesson but that selection that it makes and in this case you can see it's four thousand of a second at f5.6 that those two combined are the exposure values that have been used to get the correct exposure for this scene. ISO also does play a part in this as well, of course. Um, now, if we manually choose the ISO, the camera will always choose the exposure the aperture and the shutter values uh, based on that ISO that we currently have selected. If you are using automatic ISO, it'll actually include this as part of the exposure value as well. So when we speak about fully manual mode, we're very much going to be concentrating on trying to get the correct exposure using our apertures and our shutter speeds because these are really the two primary ways we should be getting the right exposure. ISO is a tertiary um, option available to us but just make a note of that for now now our cameras see the exact same way that we see so we haven't really spoken about this um, in terms of how our own eyes work we briefly spoke about this when we were talking about how our apertures work how our, our pupils dilate to let more light in um, and how they get smaller to restrict the amount of light coming in but how we see is that light is actually reflected off everything around us everything that you look at uh, reflects some light um, and that is what allows us to see and if you think about it, when we're in pitch darkness, when everything is completely black, that means there's a complete absence of any light at all. And this is why we can't see, because there's no light being reflected off any objects. Now, the light that's being reflected off these objects does vary. But the majority of objects around us reflect to about 12 to 18 percent of the light that hits them okay so 12 to 18 percent you might have thought it was a lot more but in actual fact a lot of the light that's hitting off the objects around us actually gets absorbed and only about 12 to 18 percent of that light is bounced back off enters our eyes and is what allows us to see our cameras work the exact same way our cameras see light and read light in the exact same way it reads the light reflected off everything around us and it reads this light based on this principle that 18 percent of the light is being reflected off these objects so the camera doesn't know what's been put in front of it but it makes an assumption that the light that's being bounced off it is about 18 percent of the light that hits it and this is where our uh, light readings begin from this is where our light meter begins to read the light now don't worry if that that seems a little bit complicated right now it'll make much more sense when we put this into practice for those of you who are a little bit more advanced you may be familiar with 18% uh, gray and gray cards and this is why they exist today are um, their, their exposure aids there to help us uh, based on this principle that 18% of the light is being reflected off any object but as I mentioned don't worry too much about that right now uh, it'll make much more sense when we put this into practice but this light that's being measured uh, being bounced off these objects and comes into our camera it's measured in what we call stops of light so what are stops of light well a stop in photography refers to a measurement of light and a stop is either doubling or halving the amount of light in your scene anytime we double the amount of light getting into the camera sensor we increase the light by one stop 
So if I say to you, I added one stop exposure to that scene, what I mean is I doubled the amount of light uh, in that particular exposure. Anytime we have the amount of light getting to the camera sensor, we decrease the light by one stop. So double the amount of light is increasing it by one stop and decreasing the amount of light uh, by half is uh, decreasing it by one stop. Now we can actually see stops in our camera and we can see them through the camera's light meter. So the light meter is what we use to measure the amount of light coming into a scene. Now when we're photographing in our auto and semi-auto modes, the camera uses the light meter as well to gauge how much light there is in the scene. But when we are shooting in fully manual mode, we will have a look at the light meter and we will interpret what it's saying to us, what it's displaying to us, and we'll make our adjustments based on um, the information that we have. But first of all, we need to identify the light meter and where it's located. So you'll see it on the back of your LCD screens. It looks something a little bit like this. Here you'll see it, you got a minus two, one, uh, a plus one and a plus two, and we have a zero in the middle. Now, some cameras will go far beyond the, the minus two to the plus two range and might go minus three to plus three, might even go beyond that. It really comes down to the brand of camera that you happen to be using. But the light meter is gonna look somewhat like this. We're gonna have the zero in the middle, our little arrow in the middle, we're going to have some numbers going to the minus and the plus either on the left and the right hand side and basically what the light meter is it's almost it's a scale it's like a scale that will tell us whether we've got too much light coming in or too little light coming in and we can make our adjustments based on whether there is too much or too little light in the scene when it's at zero when it's in the middle this is when we have what we would consider to be the correct exposure for the scene and this is where we can see the stops of light in action let's break this down a little bit more so let's learn how to read the light meter so here we've got our light meter it's at zero in this particular instance and that means that we've got the correct exposure so the right amount of light in the scene the light meter is going to indicate zero so in our semi and our auto modes the light meter will always be fixed in the center you will not see it move if you happen to switch to fully manual mode and you start moving the camera around the room you're going to see the light meter jump all over the place as the light changes but when it's in our semi auto and our auto modes it remains fixed at the center because remember these modes they just want to make sure that we get the correct exposure for the scene now if I saw the light meter indicating plus one here, this means that there's it's one stop overexposed. And this means that there's a double the amount of light coming into the scene. So remember, one stop or um, adding a stop of light is when we double the amount of light coming into the scene. So if I saw plus one, I would know before I even took the photograph that the image is going to be overexposed twice as much light is going to come in so i'd have to make an adjustment based on that we've got two stops over and it doubles again so it goes up to four times the amount of light so it multiplies so we had double the amount of light when it was at plus one but then it'll double again and it'll go all the way up to four times the amount of light if the light meter is indicating plus two two stops over so let's just break that down so plus one stop that means double the amount of light is coming into the scene that is needed to correctly expose the scene plus two stops that means we've got four times the amount of light coming in that means the image would be very overexposed and can you take a guess then as what plus three stops how much more light is going to be coming into the scene uh, if i saw that it was indicating plus three on the light meter Okay, I'll just give you a second there to type that into Morpheus, but think about it. If the, if one stop is double the amount of light and two stops is four times the amount of light, that was doubling it again. Three, to, three stops is going to be eight times the amount of light coming into the scene. And that's a huge amount of light. That's That means our image would be very overexposed in that instance. Because it doubles again, so from two stops to three stops, 
we're doubling from four times and we go up to eight times and similarly then if it was plus four stops it would be 16 times the amount of light and so on let's have a look at it on the other side so here we've got minus a stop under and remember that means half the amount of light is now getting into the scene so we've reduced the amount of light in the scene by half when it's one stop under exposed and the light meter indicates minus one in this case if i saw that it was reading a minus two it's four times less light it's now four times less light that means our image will be getting very dark and the light meter indicates minus two in this case each one of those numbers two to one to zero to plus one to plus two they are a stop in the difference now we also have these little dots here as well sometimes they appear as lines these also do mean something too these are thirds of stops we won't be speaking about them until the uh, next module and there's a particular reason for that we just want to um, understand full stops at the moment so from minus two to minus one to zero to plus one to plus two each of those is a stop in the difference so just to review our um, minus stop so minus one stop that's half the amount of light getting to the scene or getting to the camera sensor then is needed to correctly expose the scene minus two stops that's four times less light than is getting to the sensor than is needed to get the correct exposure and then i'll ask you again i'm sure you know the answer this time but minus three stops how much less light is now coming into the scene so just type it there into morpheus minus three stops how much less light is now coming into the scene and indeed it's eight times less light eight times less light is now getting to the camera sensor then is needed to correctly expose the scene so here we've got a photograph of a wall okay not the the most exciting photograph but it's going to serve the purpose for actually displaying these differences in stops and um, as we're cycling through uh, using the light meter so here we've got our light meter it's at zero and i know um now that when the light meter is indicating zero when i can see the little marker is in the center and um, that i have the correct exposure so the light meter assumes that we have the correct amount of light for the scene and all the tones are well balanced so when i say tones i mean the dark tones the light tones the the bright tones and the the black tones these are all visible we can see detail throughout all of this photograph i know it's just some brickwork that we have here but everything looks correct to our eyes let's see what happens if we add one stop of light to the scene so remember now we're one stop overexposed we now have double the amount of light coming into the scene and the details are becoming a little bit overexposed we haven't lost any details yet but it is just looking that little bit brighter now increasing exposure uh, can make photographs feel a little bit more positive um, and we use uh, kind of brighter exposures for what we call high key photography uh, where we want everything to look kind of nice and bright and airy and happy um, so there are also creative decisions to take into consideration when we're adjusting exposure so technically the correct exposure is at zero but creatively we might make that decision to add a little bit more light to the scene and um, just to make it a little bit more brighter and a little happier we go up a little bit further and we go two stops over now remember we have four times the amount of light coming into this scene now it's four times the amount of light and things are getting a little bit uh too much now we're losing details in the brickwork we're, we're kind of just seeing the outlines of everything here it almost looks like a stencil or something and it just it's not it doesn't look good and remember if the details are lost we cannot always bring them back in post-production sometimes you might get lucky and you can bring them back but if your highlights are gone or your whites are gone and you try to bring them back afterwards they're just going to look muddy they're going to look flat they're not going to look natural or correct so you really want to in most cases avoid getting an exposure that looks like this let's go the other way and let's go to minus one on the light meter and remember now we're one stop underexposed that means half the amount of light is now coming into the scene the image appears a little bit dull and flat however 
underexposing can increase saturation there this is a black and white photograph but it can increase color saturation make those colors a little bit de denser a little bit darker and it can add atmosphere to a photograph so again technically you know it's not correct because the light meter is not at zero but subjectively you could argue that this is a better exposure than the one that then is at zero so again you can kind of make these creative decisions uh, but you can only make these decisions when you understand what the correct exposure you know is meant to be you have to know what you're doing before you can start breaking the rules now if we go to minus two stops remember we have now four times less light coming in four times less light is now reaching uh, the camera sensor and um, the darkest blacks have lost all detail and the this detail is gone you're not going to get that detail back now with an exposure like this as well if you try to brighten it up in post-production you're going to reveal what's called noise especially in the shadows you're going to see this kind of grain be introduced into the photograph and you, you don't want to see that and this is we're going to talk about that in the next lesson this is um one of the things we have to be considerate of when we're they're talking about iso but it'll also be revealed if we have an underexposed photograph that we try to brighten up afterwards you're going to start introducing more noise into the scene so you've got a little bit of leeway when it comes to exposure but when you start getting into minus two and plus two this is where things get a little bit tricky and you need to generally avoid that in most types of scenes now we're going to talk about some exceptions a little bit later on but we should be keeping everything at zero and then we can make decisions based off after that if we want to add more or reduce the amount of light in the scene now I spoke about exposure values a little bit earlier on in the lesson and basically exposure values is when we use a combination of an aperture and shutter speed together to get the correct exposure now we can adjust that and we can change our aperture and we could change our shutter speed and still come out with the exact same exposure so as you can see here in my example we could be photographing at 250th of a second we've got an aperture of f 2.8 we're using an iso of 100 and that gives us the correct exposure but i decide i want to add a little bit more depth of field to the scene so i decide to change my aperture to f4 but to compensate for that to make sure i still get the correct exposure i need to open the shutter for a little bit longer so I need to open it now to balance that out to still get the correct exposure. Both settings will give me this correct exposure. So both of these exposure values are right for the scene. But I've changed the depth of field and I've changed the motion in each of these settings. And this is exactly what's happening when we're photographing in auto and semi-automatic modes. Remember, the light meter is always going to be at zero because our camera just wants to get the right exposure. Um, but the exposure values may change. So, you know, our shutter speeds and our apertures may change, but one will always balance out the other to make sure that we get the right amount of light in the scene. Let's have a look at some examples of this in action. So, I spoke about aperture priority before. We're very familiar with it now at this stage. I hope that you've actually been getting a chance to get out there and use it especially after the last lesson but let's see what happens when we're using it and what happens in terms of exposure in aperture priority mode so let's say we have a shutter speed of um, 125th of a second our aperture is at f2.8 we've got our photographer here again and we have our line of people so we're photographing and because we're at f2.8 uh, we can see we've got a nice shallow depth of field here and um, this gentleman in the foreground is in focus everyone else is out of focus but I decide that I actually want to increase the depth of field here and I want to bring it up so that this lady comes into focus so I'm going to have to close down my aperture I'm going to have to uh, use a higher f stop number so I decide to go to f11 and because I've 
um, close down the aperture. My depth of field now is much greater. It's become, uh, it's extended a lot more. But to compensate for that, to make sure I still get the right amount of light, my shutter speed has now automatically changed to an eighth of a second. So I'm still getting the correct exposure for the scene, but I've changed my depth of field. But to compensate for that, the aperture priority has chosen a shutter speed of one eighth of a second to ensure I still get the correct amount of light. And I, let's say I decide I want to bring everybody into focus in this scene. So I go all the way to F22. And in this case then, because I've closed down the aperture so small, the shutter speed now has to choose a half a second, which I definitely get camera shake if I was doing this without a tripod. So this is what you need to be careful of when you're photographing using aperture priority mode is that when you close down the aperture, you might end up introducing camera shake because the shutter has to open for a much longer amount of time to still get the correct amount of light in the scene. Now let's apply this to our shutter priority. So let me ask you a question. So we just had a look at how aperture priority uh, will change the shutter speed to make sure it gets the correct exposure. Can you tell me what you think the shutter priority is going to change to make sure it retains the correct exposure? Should be a fairly obvious one. Okay, so indeed, it's going to change the aperture to make sure that we still have the right amount of light in the scene. Let's have a look at some examples. So here we've got a nice flowing waterfall. I'm using a 15th of a second, uh, plenty of time here slow enough time, I should say, to allow the water to flow nicely through the scene. But it's, it's, in terms of light, it's actually quite a long time. So to compensate for that, to make sure that we get the right amount of light in the scene, the aperture is going to be at f16. So the camera decides that if, if the exposure is at a 15th of a second, uh, we're going to need to use an aperture of f16 to make sure that we've got the right amount of light in the scene. I decide I want to maybe freeze that motion a little bit more. So I go to uh, 125th of a second, a much faster shutter speed now. Uh, and to compensate for that, then the aperture needs to open up much wider. So remember, the lower the number, the wider the aperture, the more light that's coming in. And it now goes to f5.6. Okay, so the exposure values have changed. In terms of the overall levels of light, they haven't changed at all. But the effect in the photograph has changed. It's still got a little bit of movement in the scene for sure, but nowhere near as much as the previous photograph. Let's go and um, take this a little bit further. So I decided I really want to freeze that water. That photographing at 125th of a second wasn't enough. So I go to 500 of a second, and that's a really fast shutter speed. 500 of a second is a super fast shutter speed. And to make sure we get the right amount of light in the scene, we need now need to use an aperture of f2.8. So the camera goes ahead. If I'm lucky enough to have a lens that has an aperture of f2.8, um, the lens will open up that wide to make sure that we still get the right amount of light in the scene. Now... Also, um, it might introduce a little bit of a shallow depth of field. It hasn't in this particular scene because of the distance of the subject away from the lens. We'll speak about that uh, in a much later module. Um, but the key takeaway here is that the overall level of light remains the same. So we're using different exposure values, different shutter speeds and different apertures for each of these, or at least the camera is changing one or the other as we cycle through each of these settings um, and making sure that the right amount of light is still present in the scene. But the effect in the photograph changes. So the motion has completely changed in each of these scenes from changing the shutter speed but no matter what setting we pick, the camera strives to make sure that the exposure levels remain the same. Now, what about those instances where we're photographing in our semi-auto modes and we need to make a change to the exposure? Sometimes the camera is not always going to get it right. But it is still possible to change exposure when photographing in semi-auto modes. So when I say semi-auto modes, I'm talking about our program mode, I'm talking about shutter priority, I'm talking about aperture priority. 
in fully auto mode we can't make any changes but we can make changes in these semi auto modes by using exposure compensation so exposure compensation will allow us to add a little bit more light or to reduce the amount of light in a scene uh, when needed now when you use exposure compensation you will actually see the light meter change so you can dial it up by one or you can dial it down by one you will actually see the light meter change to let you know what type of adjustment you have made but it will stay wherever you change it to so if you apply exposure compensation to one scene be sure to change it back um, otherwise the next photograph you take is going to have the same adjustment applied to it so we can change the exposure using exposure compensation in semi-auto modes. You're going to have this little plus and minus button. We had a look at it before when we were speaking about apertures. But when we're in our semi-auto modes, we can use the uh, plus and minus button. We simply press it in and we adjust the adjustment wheel. And you can either add in uh, a stop of light, two stops of light, um, or reduce the amount of light if needed. Now, we do not use exposure compensation in fully manual mode. And the reason we don't use it in fully manual mode is we don't have to, because we dial in those adjustments manually. If we want to change the exposure in fully manual mode, we just do that ourselves. We don't need to use exposure compensation. Now, exposure compensation may also appear as a dial. Um, really, really handy, actually, if you have one of these, where you can just add a stop more light. So you can see here, these are measured in stops. We've got plus one, plus two, plus three, uh, minus one, minus two, minus three, uh, based on the stops of light principle that we had a look at earlier. Really, really handy if you have that, just to add or reduce the amount of light in a scene very, very quickly. Now also, just remember as well, with exposure compensation, you are still operating within the parameters of capturing light, which is your apertures, your shutter speeds. So, you know, if you are photographing in aperture priority and you decide that you want to increase the amount of light in the scene by using exposure compensation it's going to change the shutter speed it has to get that light from somewhere so you're still operating within those principles now there's particular cases uh, where the light meter is going to get it wrong and where we are going to need to use exposure compensation and that's when we talk about things that have dark tones at the start of the lesson i mentioned that the light meter and how we see um works on this idea this assumption that objects are reflecting 18 percent of the light that hits it and it bases it's this reading off this assumption however it can get this wrong when presented with an object that reflects more or less light than 18 percent light so like this cat here um, a dark object on a dark background can appear overexposed um, with the light meter at zero. Similarly, as well, just so all you dog lovers aren't left out, with white tones, a white subject on a white background can appear underexposed when the light meter is placed at zero. Look at these two photographs side by side. So they're very contrasty. We have one that's dark against dark background and white against a white background and the light meter simply cannot see both when the light meter is at zero what it's seeing is gray it assumes everything that's in this range is gray now this is something we'll definitely be speaking a lot more extensively about as we move on throughout the course it's very important to understand but as we have seen, if we add more light, plus one or plus two, we're adding more light to the scene, everything appears a little bit more white, um, and certainly in this particular scene, we can see here that it is much brighter. And this is the exact opposite. We've got a dark object against a dark background, I should say a dark subject, against the dark background and again having this at zero would mean that everything appears gray let's let's have a look at this again in more detail so imagine we took this photograph of our dog the light meter is at zero this is probably the kind of result that we would end up getting everything is gray and flat and underexposed this scene is underexposed it's a white object against the white background um, a white subject against the white background it's reflecting more light than the 18 percent assumption that the light meter makes so we need to add more light to this scene 
and in this case we're going to because we're photographing in our semi-auto modes we use our exposure compensation and we simply dial up the exposure to plus one remember that doubles the amount of light in the scene and we now get something that looks more correct to our eyes and is the correct exposure for this scene let's go back to the cat and again if we expose this scene at the light meter at zero it over exposes this scene it makes everything appear gray you can see we're actually losing some details in there and so on but it doesn't look right it's too bright it's overexposed and again we're changing a dark uh, subject uh, against a dark background um, and we're turning it to gray by exposing with the light meter at zero so again we introduce our exposure compensation and we can now underexpose the scene by one stop and remember that's reducing the amount of light in the scene by half and we now have something that is the correct exposure now in truth these kind of scenarios are going to be fairly few and far between um, in your day-to-day -day photography and really for the majority of scenes we should be exposing with the light meter at zero and this is so certainly something we'll expand on in the next lesson when we're talking about doing our fully manual exposures but there are going to be situations where like this your subjects are going to be bright or dark and you're going to have to make adjustments um, based on that or perhaps you also want to do it for creative reasons as well like I mentioned you might want to add a little bit of light or reduce the amount of light in the scene for creative purposes too okay but if there's one thing you take away from this lesson is that the correct exposure is when the light meter is at zero and that we measure the amount of light in the scene by using stops of light. So with that, that's a very, very good foundation for what we're going to be doing in our next lesson, which it is our fully manual mode, fully manual. This is a really big lesson, a key lesson of the course up to this point. So we're going to have a look at doing fully manual exposures, how we can take full control over the camera by reading the light, deciding our exposure based on what aperture and shutter speeds we want to use, um, and using our creative vision to finally capture that photograph in fully manual mode. We'll also introduce ISO as well. Um, you know, it's something that we only introduce at this stage because really it's not until you get to the fully manual mode that it becomes much more important in our photography. So we'll have a look at all that in the next lesson as well. And we finish things off then as well by speaking about RAW and JPEG. And this is going to be our next big challenge is photographing in fully RAW mode. We'll speak about what RAW is if you've never heard of it before um, and why you should be looking to use it uh, very soon in the future. So we're coming to the end of lesson number seven. So we only have one lesson left in this module. And just before we finish up, I just want to ask you a very quick question. I want you to think back to why you signed up to this course in the first place. What were your goals for this course? What did you want to achieve by the end of this course? Why are you here? So are you...